Finally, finally we arrive at conflict-driven no-good learning and we will see how an ASP server works under the hood. Actually, I'd say that this is one of the highlights of this course because you'll be confronted with completely new algorithmic ideas, namely the one of conflict-driven constraint learning, a technique pioneered in the area of constraint processing and satisfiability testing. So what we will do now, we will more or less take these ideas from these fields and plug in our no good based characterization uh, to which actually we work quite hard going all these characterizations and now eventually this will pay off. So what's so special now about this? Well, I guess we all came across backtracking as a technique for implementing search in our undergraduate days, even, even I did so. So, and there the idea is more or less, well, we, 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 we traverse a search tree and whenever we find a conflict, well, we look for the next best alternative and, and, and try this out. So more or less we get a conflict, we go back one level, try the alternative, uh, work our way through this, and at some point we go back, go one level up, etc. right? And this we more or less, we backtrack our way through the search space by going up always one level by trying the next alternative. Now, what is different now in such a conflict-driven uh, setting is that once you hit a conflict, you don't just backtrack, no, you think first. And the overall idea is that you learn from your mistakes. So the idea is you take the conflict and actually you have a representation of this conflict, which in our case is a no good that has been violated. Now you take this no good and you, you transform this. You transform this such that it gives you two pieces of information. First of all, where the actual conflict occurred because this is where you're going to jump back to. So you're not bothering by backtracking your way up, no, you directly jump to the origin of the conflict. And then actually what you do there, uh, you add actually this new information, that's the second piece that you, that you get from translating the, the, the no good, you add this new no good to the problem. Well, this no good actually was implicit information that was already inherent in, 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 the, in, the, in the problem that you now make explicit and it has been transformed in such a way that it immediately leads to propagation. So you're back to a place where you were at the time, you could not propagate anymore, but now with the new information you will propagate and we get new inferences at that time. So what is really intri intrigued me at the time, it's not about jumping back and flipping an alternative. No, now you jump back and just propagate again and let the, th let, let the algorithm do propagation and then choices again. Anyway, that's the idea of learning by mistake. So you more or less, you take your conflict, you have a representation of it, you add it to your, to your problem specification and also you jump more or less to the origin of the conflict. So that's all hand waving and we will make this precise in what follows. Okay, so back to our everlasting question. What is a stable model? Well, I know we all used a lot of sweat in going through these characterizations. Me, actually, at the time when I had to learn them and now actually also when I had to, to teach them to you because, of course, they are all non-trivial. But now we actually ended up at the algorithmic characterization. We will now actually uh, devise a set of algorithms that will allow, will allow us to compute the stable models of a logic program. So, I hope you enjoy it just as much as I do. And so, bear with me. But before looking at the itchy gritty details of these algorithms, let's hover in smoothly from a bird's eye perspective, right? So if you look a little bit at the development in satisfiability solving, things started out with the so-called DPLL or Davis, Putnam, Logman and Loveland procedure in the early 60s, even before I was born. Anyway, at the time, this DPLL algorithm was a backtracking based search algorithm that relied on unit propagation. More or less what we've seen also on the no-goods, just that this was at the time invented for clauses, disjunctions of literals. And actually you've seen the, this algorithmic shape already in the part on the computation, you know, where we had actually a more complicated uh, propagation algorithm, which we call expand. And then we had the search algorithm on top of this, where we first did propagation, then we checked whether we had uh, obtained a conflict. If not, we backtracked. Otherwise, we checked whether we have obtained a complete uh, assignment. Then we print it. It's a solution. And if not, we are sure that we have a conflict-free but partial assignment or model or how you may call it. And then we did case analysis. We, we picked an atom and, and had two cases. Once we added it as a true atom to the problem and once we added it as a false atom, right? 
And then, of course, when, when we first tried the one search space, we went up and tried the second alternative. And this is exactly more or less, or somehow exactly, right? <laughs> How the DPLL algorithm worked. And again, go back to the part on the computation, there you will see the, the very simple layout of this. And in ASP, this approach was actually pursued by the very first ASP system, uh, S-models, which was built at the time at the University of Hel Technical University of Helsinki, which is now called Alto University. Good. Now, modern uh, ASP solvers, as well as modern SAT solvers and many modern CP solvers, rely on CDCL, on conflict-driven constraint learning. And in, in, in SAT solving, as well as in, in, in ASP solving, but based on no goods, the basic inference method is unipropagation. But then again, this learning from mistakes approach kicks in, right? Where there is conflict resolution or actually conflict, a conflict analysis happening. And this is done by the resolution principle. And I will do a, a Blueboard video on that just for those of you who are not familiar with this. And then, of course, the, the usual drill happens. You run into a conflict, you transform it via a resolution. Then you take it under your arm, you record it, you may call it learning, but everybody calls everything learning these days. So let's stay with recording when you see learning. Then you back jump to the origin of it, and then you take this recorded or learned information, and you, you do, which will then be uh, um, ready for unit propagation, and you assert its conclusion, right? And this, for instance, in ASP, this was first done in a genuine way in, in CLASP that we developed in Potsdam and of course it's now also under the hood of Klingo if you're using it. Okay, now, now that you've seen a bit the features and I, I'm still hand-waving, let's look at an abstract description of these algorithms. So here's an outline of DPL-based search. Well, those of you who know it or those of you who looked at the uh, algorithm in the computational part may scratch their head and say, oh, that looks different. Yes, it does. And the reason is we rearrange the cases to align it with the CDCL algorithm on the next slide. Okay, now actually again, CDCL stands for conflict-driven uh, constraint learning. And so the conflict is more or less a central, a central notion in this algorithm. And accordingly here, the, the major conditional checks whether there has been a conflict or not, right? So that's more or less the redesign or the basis of the redesign of the, of, of the reordering. Anyway, let's look at it uh, in, in, in order. So first of all, we loop, right? So we loop more or less until the problem has either been found to be unsatisfiable or um, or we got actually a, a, a solution. Good. So then when we enter the loop, that's always the same thing in, in, in constraint processing algorithms, we propagate, right? We try to deterministically assign truth values to variables. And that's also happening here. In our case, this is mainly unit propagation. So we also speak here of deterministically assigning uh, truth values to to. Uh, to variables, which can be atoms or bodies, right? Because we calculate this, right? This is done by unit propagation. Okay, so then we are, then when, when we are, once we are done, we more or less analyze the result of propagation. So if there was no conflict and all variables have been assigned, hooray, we got a solution, we print it to our user and we're happy and make the user happy as well. Anyway, if not, so if we have, of course, we have not obtained a conflict, but there remain unassigned variables, then we come to something like a non-deterministic assignment of a truth value to a variable, because we have, let's say, a bucket of unassigned variables, and now we can choose one of them. And this, this, this way of choosing is actually the reason why we call this also a non-deterministic assignment, because often we have a heuristic and this heuristic helps us to pick one, but we could equally well pick another, right? Okay, so this happens, and this is normally in the, in the algorithms that you've seen in the computational part. This is actually once we pick one, we then make up the, the, the case where the atom is true and then the case where the atom is false. Okay, good. So what, he, what we do here is, so we decide, so we pick, we pick an atom, we assign it a truth value, and we continue. So we loop again, and then, of course, uh, we propagate and, and do the whole procedure again. However, if we obtain the conflict, so then we are in the second case here. Uh, the first thing we check, and this is again uh, 
by alignment to the, the conflict-driven search on the next slide, we check actually whether we got a top-level conflict, and this is actually a conflict that does not depend on any decisions we made. That's a conflict that we obtained just by propagating on the original problem formulation, right? So it does not depend on any uh, non deterministic assignments. We're not somehow in the search. You know, this is something which says the original problem is unsatisfiable. If this is the case, then we return unsatisfiable and we're done, right? If not, then we were in the middle of our search, we backtrack. And this means more or less we remove all assignments that have been made since the last decision, since we last uh, assigned a choose value to a variable uh, non deterministically in this step here. Okay, so we clear more or less our stack, depends on how you look at it, right? So we clear things out, we are at this decision, and then we flip. And flipping means we flip the truth value if possible. So if, if we can flip the truth value, if there is still the second alternative available, great, we flip it and then we, we start looping again. If not, of course, then we, if, if we have already tried all cases, then we go up another level, right? And this is more or less the idea of uh, DPL. Okay, now let's look at CDCL. How does conflict-driven uh, no-good learning work? So here's now the outline of search via conflict-driven constraint learning. And what? They look the same? Well spotted. Well, let's actually go back and forth for you to note the difference. Okay, this is CDCL style solving. This is DPLL style solving. And as you noticed, the difference is just in the last two lines. Let's look at these guys. So in DPLL style solving, we arrive here actually if we had a conflict. And so what we do is we backtrack. So we remove all assigned literals of the last uh, decision level. And then we see whether we can flip. If not, we have to go higher, right? But so we more or less go one level higher in the normal case. And then we insert actually the, uh, we flip the decision literal. Okay, that's what we do here. What do we do in CDCL? Well, there again, we think first. This is actually what we do here when we analyze. So we take the conflict that occurred and keep in mind, in our no good setting, this actually means that a no good is now contained in the assignment. That is, all literals of the no goods are part of the assignment. And then we transform this guy actually by um, resolution uh, and we get a, a new representation of, a, of, of this conflict. And this guy has actually an interesting property. There's only one literal from the current decision level left. So all the other literals are from decision level up the tree, right? Good. So what we do then is we take this guy and we clear assignments and we take this guy up with us. And we always check actually when we clear decision level, uh, does this guy allow us to do unit propagation? Actually, once we cleared the last decision level, it, it does allow us to do unit propagation because there's only one literal left from the, from the decision level where the conflict occurred. So there it would be unit, it would allow us to do unit propagation. But well, we stay cool. We keep cleaning, cleaning, cleaning until this guy is, cannot provide us with unit propagation anymore. And that's actually where the origin of the conflict lies. That's where we add it and resume. So, and the important thing here is to, is to, to note that there is no flipping. Right? So we analyze the conflict, we magically transform it, then we go back to where the conflict occurred, and then we resume propagation, which at the time we couldn't resume anymore because we, we, we reached a fixed point. But now with the new information, we can resume it. Okay, that's more or less the idea. And otherwise, the algorithm is exactly the same, right? So we propagate at the beginning, check whether there is a conflict, whether we got a solution. And if we didn't get a solution, then we do, we, we, we pick non-deterministically in atom, assign a truth value and continue. But we are not flipping anymore. We're not taking a, a, a decided literal and look for the alternative. So we jump back and once we jump back, then propagation resumes because we now have new information that we didn't have when we were there the first time. Okay, again, hand-waving, and I know it, but actually the whole chapter, it I would really advise you to actually go back and forth because I now throw some information at you 
uh, that of course you can't grasp because you haven't seen the details. But it may ring a bell and perhaps you get parts of the intuition when we get now to the itchy gritty details and look at these algorithms in detail. So I hope you still bear with me. So.